Hello. Oh, Zefa, can you share screen and actually, um, you know, or enable sharing screen and actually make that a default? Yeah. Won't let me edit while the meeting is in progress. Uh, I'll change the defaults after we're done. Jill said yesterday is going to come. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Jay. Hello. How are things going? I'm not too bad. Very quiet. It's Easter holiday. So. Oh, I see. Oh, it's a holiday. Right. No, it's like there's a Easter summer. A uh, uh, Good Friday. It's Friday. So many people are taking like off this week. I see, I see. Hi, Anthony. Hey, Sarita. Hey, hi, Angel. Good to see you. Hello. <laughs> good, good afternoon and good morning. Yeah, thanks for doing this. We just wait a minute or so, Angel, a couple of minutes. Uh, while we're doing that, uh, we can check if the, my screen share is working. Yeah. yeah, please do. Can you see the slides? Yes. Okay, perfect. Oh, cool. Hey, Malesh. Sarita, I don't know. Do you know do you know Malesh? He's um a postdoc in my group who's working on um volumetric streaming stuff. Oh, well, we should connect. Yeah. I know. Hi, Hi, I don't think. I don't know if you've met before. I I introduced to you last last I think a couple of weeks ago, but yeah, you must have forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, yeah. There's a lot going on. This group, this group is uh, is growing rapidly, which is great. So yeah. 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 Okay, we should uh, we should talk, Malesh. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's uh, lots of people here in this in this group who are very interested in that. And uh, maybe you guys can give a talk whenever you're ready. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would be great. Yeah, I also wanted to reach out to Muhammad and talk a little bit, but yeah, I yeah. think it's, it's, yeah. it's a great idea. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so let's see. Hi, Javier. How are you? Doing good. How are you? Good, good. I think we should start asking people to put their affiliation so it's easier to, to see. Yeah. Um, okay, maybe we can start. We usually run out of time, uh, so we should we should just get started and people will join. Um, so yeah, it's a, a welcome to the Elixir Consortium Open Meetings. Um, it's really a very special pleasure to welcome Anjul Patne, who's a principal research scientist at, uh, in NVIDIA's Human Performance and Experience Research Group. Um, Anjul has been, uh, he's, he's also worked at, uh, I guess, what's now Meta Reality Labs. And he's, a, he's, he's one of the foremost experts in things like foveated rendering, lots of graphics and, and uh, VR related things, um, and uh, some really interesting work 
on image quality assessment. And we've been collaborating with Anjul for, uh, for a bit now, and it's just been an absolute pleasure. Um, uh, as, as you all know, um, figuring out how to evaluate the quality of, of images for um, XR displays is, is really difficult, but, but super important. And you know, one of the things that Elixir brings in is this whole end-to-end -end, uh, system performance, but you can't measure performance unless you have metrics. So I'm really excited about uh, Anjul's talk today. Uh, let's uh, welcome him and uh, Anjul, take it away. Wow, Th thanks for the generous introduction. That was super, uh, super nice of you. Uh, yeah, so uh, as, as Sarita mentioned, I'm a researcher in sort of the human performance and experiences group. I've done, like in the past, I've done work in computer architecture, and, uh, just, just high performance computer graphics, but I find myself really interested these days in kind of how, uh, how humans view com computer graphics, especially through like, you know, special novel displays that are becoming rapidly really popular. And uh, just the reason is that like, you know, it's, it's almost impossible at this stage for these kind of applications to eliminate the, uh, the, the importance of uh, what goes on in the user's eye and the brain as they're experiencing these unique experiences. That's kind of where, where I uh, come looking at these experiences. So today specifically, I'll be talking about uh, image quality assessment and uh, specifically for these uh, experiences that, that are, uh, that are rapidly becoming very popular, very uh, interesting, and also very under addressed in this area. Um, let me see. Yeah, uh, the key kind of uh, motivation for why we're kind of get even uh, getting to this point where we need a metric or image quality assessment for uh, VR and AR displays is that the pixels that we draw for VR and AR uh, content and experiences are almost by definition, very expensive. Uh, we're dealing with extremely high resolutions. We're dealing with high frame rates. We're dealing with uh, multiple views at times, you know, at least two, but sometimes even more than that, depending on what kind of display you're working on. And then uh, you have uh, sometimes severe li limitation on the kind of hardware and the kind of transmission uh, bandwidth that you can utilize to, uh, to feed those displays. And so because of that, every pixel that you're drawing effectively as uh, uh, is, is uh, you have to judiciously use all of the available computation that you have to draw each pixel. And what, what I mean by using it judiciously is that uh, all the computation that you perform or uh, should be, should go into adding a meaningful perceptual experience to the user in the sense that if a user is not noticing a change, any computation that I perform to, uh, uh, to cause that change or to implement an effect that causes that change is going to be redundant and useless. On the other hand, if I, uh, if I have a limited budget for drawing pixels on the image, which I almost always do for an ARVR system, whether it's coming from the power, it's coming from the network bandwidth, it's coming from the computation limits of the device, or even like the, uh, the heating or thermal limits of the device, no matter where that constraint is coming from, it makes it really important for me to uh, choose very carefully what I'm trying with my pixels. And so this trade-off is kind of inbuilt and very extreme for VR and AI devices. That's why it's super important to think about it. Uh, obviously, if you want to maximize the perceptual quality or to maximize the ratio of perceptual quality over the cost that we pay for it, uh, we need to find a good way to estimate the perceptual impact of uh, drawing pixels inexpensively or efficiently. And there's two ways to do that. The first way is to conduct a user study, right? Every time I design a new algorithm or a new architecture or a new streaming technology or a new uh, you know, way of representing data, I could, I could go to like a set of you know, tens or hundreds of users. I could have them select what they think is, whether the experience that they, that they perceive is maintained or improved or worsened, right? However, it is like, you know, as many people in this, uh, in the audience might know, designing an accurate study that produces unbiased uh, and uh, reliable results is complicated, but when it's done correctly, it is accurate. On the other hand, it's also expensive, both in time and money. And there are chances that 
just based on the noise of uh, or or the parameters of how you design the study, you might end up with an uh, with a conclusion that doesn't answer the question you wanted to ask, and then you have to either redesign the study or reconsider the algorithm or the or the method that you're testing. An alternative is to use computational image quality metrics, and uh, uh, just by the very simple examples of those things can be mean square errors or SSI. You're basically comparing uh, a test image against a reference image and trying to estimate if the uh, if the quality visual quality of the test image. Uh, as opposed to before you use this method or when you use a different method, whether it's maintained or improved or worse, depending on the kind of goal you're after, right? Uh, however, if you look at all of the existing metrics or most of the existing metrics that are in the community, reliable, used for various uh, algorithms, uh, they tend to fall short when it comes to VR, VR and AR displays. Specifically, uh, it's, it's, all, it's very rare for good metrics to be uh, retargetable to the specific viewing conditions that uh, VR presents. So for example, like you would, all the user studies and the data sets that most metrics have usually been fit on are kind of designed around an environment of looking at an image on a desktop display with like a natural light in the background, right? So the data set is always fit to that. Now in a VR environment, you have a very different uh, viewing condition. You have um, a much higher field of view you have a, the display that is uh, has a very different angular density of pixels that you're seeing, much lower than the, those displays. Uh, and then uh, uh, it is also uh, in a different kind of background illumination condition. It's usually dark around you when you're looking at VR pixels. Sometimes it's not if you're doing AR, but for VR, for example, it's not. Uh, furthermore, there are sort of new artifacts and new kind of complexities that will arise with when you're drawing pixels for VR and AR. These are complicated things that are new or novel that wouldn't just exist in this previous implicit environment and consequently not addressed by the metrics. So these are things like um, you have a different version or different sensitivity to spatial and temporal artifacts. So for example, uh, you're viewing uh, images as stereo. And so you might uh, experience any inconsistency in stereo might show up as an artifact when that just that concept doesn't exist for desktop viewing for most part. Uh, further, things like immersion and consistency of like you know the various stimuli you're receiving from your uh, from from the uh, from the head head mounted display setup that you have uh, are also things that you just don't experience there. So it's it's really hard to expect any of these ex ex existing metrics to be good at good at these kind of problems. And so hence we require something that. Um, that will start to address uh, some of these specific artifacts in some of these specific viewing conditions. And so uh, we, we took one such effort, one kind of uh, uh, a step towards that direction. What we tried to design was a, a perceptual metric, image quality assessment metric that was, uh, uh, that was specially designed for wide field of view video. And the two terms, wide field of view video, here represent like uh, the kind of kind of artifacts and the kind of viewing conditions that you would experience in AR. It doesn't cover the whole gamut of the problems that I just described, but it's like takes one step towards the problems that are really important. Specifically, it helps, uh, helps identify artifacts in foveated graphics. Uh, this work was done in, done in you know, collaboration. Uh, this, uh, we worked on this paper while I was at, a, uh, while, while I was at Meta Reality Labs now. It used to be Facebook Reality Labs. Uh, and it was done in collaboration with the University of Cambridge. Uh, Rafal Mantiuk, who's the first author of this paper, is a professor who basically uh, knows anything and everything about image quality assessment. It's published at SIGGRAPH last year um, and it's available online. Uh, okay, so name's kind of a mouthful. So I thought I, I usually try to describe the, uh, what it really means. The name is FOV Video VDP. So FOV stands for foveation, which is kind of the, um, the aspect of the metric that it's able to account for for real as well as peripheral vision, so it can, it can, it it tries to model the differences in your vision as they change from the center to the kind of periphery of your vision. So you have lower acuity in the periphery or slightly different acuity in the periphery. Uh, it's going to account for that when it tries to look at the difference between images, which means that it also needs to understand where your gaze is when you're uh, when you're when you're comparing two images. Second thing is that it uh, it's specifically targeted towards videos. But that's because it considers not just spatial uh, quality problems, but also temporal quality problems. 
And finally, it's a visible difference predictor. So it tries to predict uh, a probability of what a of whether a user will see a particular difference or not. And more specifically, it tries to predict whether they will be uh, they will find it objectionable or to, to, to the degree that they will find it objectionable. So uh, that likelihood is kind of the output of the network and it helps you kind of understand if the met metric is a particular number as the output, what's the, uh, what's the meaning of that number? And I'll come to details of all of those things. Um, here's the architecture of the metric. It requires two inputs and pro pro provides two outputs. The first input on the left here is a, is a group of reference and test videos. So these are uh, sequences of images that represent the reference video and a test video. And you can see like, you know, in this case, it's like a blurry test video. So it has to identify that it's, uh, that it's like, you know, uh, blurred and how, how much visible that blur is based on the particular display and viewing conditions that is a second kind of input to the network. The output of the output of the algorithm or the network or the method is a difference map. It kind of predicts where uh, one will see the errors in the in the between the two images, and then also an overall quality score, kind of trying to just try to give you that probability or the estimate of likelihood of how how objectionable is this image overall compared to the reference image. Um, so certain characteristics of the metric based on this architecture. Uh, it is a full reference metric, which means it requires an exact reference, which so requires the target image to be present. Uh, this is not always true in like in the wild, but uh, but often when you're you know designing systems or designing interfaces, it's, it's, it's easier to ex to also generate like you know what is the ideal case image that I would want, and then compare compare your uh, you know realistic output against the ideal one. Uh, it is retargetable, which means that it's not just designed for AR VR displays. It kind of will map to uh, you know desktop displays or like you know looking at uh, an image on your computer or also looking at it from like across the room on your television and those kind of things. And finally, the output is uh, aimed at being perceptually meaningful, where like uh, the score even the score that you get has uh, has some perceptual meaning, uh, unlike some of the other metrics where where like, you know, if you have an SSIM score of like 0 0.9, it's very hard to kind of gather what that really implies. Even though you know that if, if you have a score of 0 0.9 versus 0 0.95, you know that the 95 is looking better. You don't know how much better or you don't know how, how good is it in absolute, like is it, is it a good enough output or not? Uh, this metric tries to answer that question. It's not like fully there, but it takes, takes a few steps in that direction as well. Uh, here's the kind of out rough outline of the metric. Uh, the architecture that it uses, uh, it sort of, uh, its architecture is designed around using physical units for everything so that uh, all the numbers are kind of meaningful and like, you know, it can easily retarget by scaling those physical units, resolutions, screen sizes, intensities, those kind of things. Um, it first decomposes each of the input images into uh, some spatiotemporal frequency bands. And then it takes the difference between those, be between reference and test and then scales them by uh, measured functions of visual sensitivity to those frequencies and those contrasts. And then finally pulls the entire output from those bands into a single number that you can use as your quality measure. Uh, we optimize and fit the metric over like a few uh, user gathered data sets that cover you know, spatial artifacts as well as temporal artifacts, as well as sort of foveated kind of peripheral artifacts. And finally, uh, we calibrate it to produce like more sort of perceptual meaningful output. Uh, the, the, the metric is open source. You can download it and run it either in PyTorch or MATLAB. And uh, it also, it uses both CPU and GPU. So it, we've tried to make it efficient so it runs fast. Not so fast though, like it, uh, for a 4K video, it takes like 15 seconds per second of the video. So it's uh, 15 times lower than the actual video. Um, Here's kind of like the whole full pipeline of the metric and I'll go like step-by-step step into each step of how it does. Um, as I described previously, there's a couple of videos that are input plus viewing conditions. The first step that we do is kind of take those videos that are described in you know images and pixels and frames and then try to convert them into uh, real physical units. Uh, specifically, we take each value of each pixel that is each RGB value of the pixel that we get and we convert it to like a luminance value, which is in real physical candela per meter square units. 
uh, we consider the display gamma, the dynamic range of the display, as well as the color gamut. And so, uh, you know, if you have a uh, if you have an OLED display with a certain uh, with an sRGB uh, gamma and like and color gamut, you can account for that. If you have like a HDR display with like a Rec 2020 gamut and a dynamic range of say 2,000 uh, candela per meter square, it can account for that. Uh, we also compute like the angular or the perceived density of pixels that changes across the display. We, at the moment, we assume only flat displays, but these days you also have curved displays that have like that have less of this effect. Effectively, what we are trying to compute is an estimate of pixels per degree at each pixel of your image. Um, naturally, like the closest point that you have will have like the lowest pixel of uh, PPD value near the edges or the corners of the display, you're gonna have a much higher value depending on kind of the field of view you have that the display. So a low field of display, like a cell phone, will probably have a very small range of, uh, of, of uh, uh, PPT. So, you know, uh, sort of an iPhone can might go from like 120 uh, just to few, few pixels per degree around that. Uh, however, something like a display that's a really high field of view that, you know, say, sitting close to your eye in a VR headset like the Oculus Quest 2, you will notice that it like the PPD changes significantly from like 15 all the way to 25. And you also see here like this, that there is a, you know, almost an order of magnitude difference in density between the displays that we have in VR versus the displays that we have in cell phone, which is uh, staggering to imagine. Um, it's important to point out that there are things that, you, that the metric doesn't consider for various reasons. Uh, we try to Big things that are most important to compute, uh, like a meaningful output of image quality, but also something that where we have data available to do those measurements. Uh, color qu qualifies as one of those things where it, it's not as important to measuring image quality in most cases as it uh, as, as the luminance channel of an image is. But on the other hand, it's also uh, very hard to calibrate for color because there's just the community just doesn't have enough data sets for for uh, uh, color perception of images. They're just, they're, they're there, but they're very few and not measured very extensively. Uh, we are also not considering things like ambient illumination in a room. Like, you know, are you in a bright room? Are you in a dark room? Something that we, sh we should, if you're like in a VR versus an AR environment, we're also not considering lens distortions in AR VR, which tend to be important based on like, you know, um, whether like if you want to, let's say, choose between like a Fresnel lens and a non-Fresnel lens, and you wanted to account for image quality there, uh, we, we don't do that. And this, the, the, the reason for these last two things is that it's, these things are just hard to measure. We want the metric to be practical to use. So it's really hard for us to, uh, uh, with displays that don't measure ambient illumination, even though there are some, come, some that are coming that will be doing that soon. Um, it's hard to kind of uh, ask a user to figure out a way to provide background illumination if you can't provide it for them or if you can't have some default useful values. The same for lens distortions. We don't want a user to be able to, to have to like, you know, open up a display and uh, look at the, you know, the, the physical parameters or measure them or reverse engineer them uh, to try to account for lens distortions. Although this kind of, this assumption does, does kind of, is, is a little bit different when you're sort of Elixir or environment where you're designing your end-to-end -end system, because there you actually have the liberty to, uh, to, to uh, explicitly look at these parameters. So if I were to redesign this for in, in a sort of system where it was end-to-end -end open source, then I would be able to have all of these parameters also as part of the metric because those are the things I can measure and control and estimate. So that would be a uh, that would really help this metric be a lot more accurate. At the moment, we did in the in the in this work we didn't do that simply because it just wasn't practical given the ecosystem that we have with uh, with AI and VR um, uh, as it stands today. So I have a question. Um, uh, so let's take lens distortion. Um, so you say you don't account for it, but is this um, is the perceptible impact of lens distortions dependent significantly on scenes, or is this like a one shot kind of a thing that one can think about as um, sort of impacting? Like, like to what extent? to you know the various techniques that we might work on like foveation etc right um, impact the the impact of uh, lens distortion um so once uh, certainly like uh, um, uh, one of the distortion is certainly the uh, 
the you know the shape of the lens that causes can cause you know artificial ringing and those kind of artifacts that will certainly be um, independent of the scene and you can easily measure. But uh, the other artifacts that might occur due to lens distortion, things like chromatic aberrations, spherical aberration, those kind of things, um, those things I think are uh, it it might we may be able to model that, but the impact of them might be very task dependent. Um, for most tasks, we find that users tend to focus near or uh, close to the center of the screen, even if they uh, even if the task requires like a lot of peripheral uh, stimulus. Like you know, if you have a shooting game that you're like you know to look around and shoot, people tend to uh, move to the new target with their head first, or if, if it goes beyond 15 degrees of excentricity, they try to move that. Uh, however, if there's like a task that specifically utilizes peripheral vision or an experience that requires high quality there, uh, it's it's quite possible to uh, to, to see that uh, it would be useful. Um, with us, with the metric as it stands, it just has no way of knowing the difference between images on that axis. So it just don't know if it, it just doesn't know if it's gonna be useful. Um, it's quite likely that it's 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 like a big nothing burger, then it's like it's not really causing any meaningful impact to the metric. But without like knowing those distortions, it's very hard to kind of and to have specific metrics. I'll also come to this discussion later in the talk where I talk about how metrics are very closely tied to the application that we're working on, and uh, that really influences uh, you know the degree of and the visibility of artifacts and how important they are. And then secondly, how the metric should be architected. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, I I think the like you know the um, uh, lens distortion would be important to account for uh, for experiences that have a uh, good like reasonable peripheral component. Uh, hi, I have a quick question follow up. This is Javier from Intel. Uh, to what extent does this uh, um, metric uh, count uh, movement? Meaning, I mean. Um, is there any difference in the perceived quality uh, when the user is barely moving its head versus when there's a lot of movement? Um, yeah, so the, the metric actually doesn't do a really good job with um, two things. First is uh, eye movement, which is, uh, uh, which is like, you know, if you were tracking an object and then, you know, like let's say you do a VOR movement, which is like, if I'm looking at like my thumb here, and then I just like move my head while still looking at my thumb. Uh, I have really good quality vision of my, what my thumb is doing, even though if you just look at the pixels that are rendered on my retina, um, uh, there's a lot of like noise and blur in that value. And so it doesn't do a very good job because it uh, we don't account for uh, specific eye motions like fixation and saccades and smooth pursuit and what happens during them. We kind of uh, do like sort of a, like a, um, uh, like a mean version of if your gaze was there and your head was still, what would you observe? And so that would be one, one aspect where like heavy motion could have problems. The other one where heavy motion could have problem is that uh, we don't ac account for uh, differences between the visual and vestibular system perception. So in, in the sense that like, if I'm move, moving, my hand, moving my head really fast, uh, I expect based on like the acceleration in my head, for this, for the image to move in a particular way, and that kind of does, that does feed into like uh, how my eyes move in in the opposite direction to kind of maintain that image as as, as stable as possible. And since we don't account for both eye motion as well as those effects, uh, they, it, a lot of like the motion related artifacts will become tricky to account for. And uh, once again, like you know, for applications where that matters a lot. I think um, I think you would need, we would want to redesign a specific metric or or account for those factors in the metric. This one particularly doesn't. Is like uh, the reasons are you know it's just it's complicated as it is, and the first step towards this direction, and the second one is just like um, the application that we were considering were largely like you know free viewing in VR, like not like actively doing like esports or kind of have high activity environment. But uh, if you were considering that, I certainly would look at that as um, you know more aggressively. Uh, you also would need a lot more data for these kind of things because uh, there's very little under like very little kind of uh, perceptual modeling for how people perceive images during eye motion and during heavy movement. Thank you. Are, are there any more questions?
Uh, yeah, I have another question about lens distortion. Yeah. So XR runtimes apply a distortion correction, which in an ideal world should cancel out the distortions from the lens itself. Uh, assuming we were in that ideal world, this metric would not have to account for distortions, right? Yes, if you were if if you were able to in, and and I think that's why I think the effect is subtle is because they do apply some of that distortion, and so what you do see like you know if you if you just um, uh, try to model what you're seeing, assuming perfect inverse distortion and lens distortion is effectively a display that's like uh, of like that's one meter from you and like one meter by one meter wide roughly, yeah. right? And that would be perfectly represented. It would be indistinguishable from uh, from a display that's physically there rather than virtually there. Right. Uh, and that's exactly what we assume in this metric. We assume that that all, all those factors are kind of canceled out by the distortion correction and those kind of things. And then you have this virtual display that's uh, at the right, at the FOV that you that you uh, that you expect. And uh, based on that, we compute all of these physical parameters. Gotcha. So Makes ideally, sense. like ideally, you would like you know. Granted that the impact may be subtle for some applications. Ideally, you would account for like the distortion as well as inverse distortion, and then that will give you like a slightly different Im image as opposed to like a physical display there. And then, the, then you can think about the right. difference in quality, right? Like for example, if I was um, if I was if I was tuning my inverse lens distortion function, then that's one place where a metric could help. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's what I was thinking. I mean, yeah. So with Elixir, we can actually we control the distortion function, right? So we apply our own distortion function. And I was just thinking in my head if there was some interesting research to be done here that that could be enabled uh, by the fact that we have control of the distortion function. Um, it turns out it's not very expensive though, right? Our just it's it's um yeah. So. Um, I don't know what kind of trade-offs we would study with that, but it's just a thought. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that this thing would become really interesting if you were doing, you know, uh, uh, complicated lens shapes and like as people are kind of doing in, in cameras already these days where you're like designing a um, weird lens type where the distortions are kind of harder to model cleanly. And mm -hmm. then you were trying to understand with what kind of inverse distortion would be necessary there. Uh, whether you're designing it for physical comfort or size or weight or some other up some other parameter you want to optimize, you want to make if you were kind of studying and trying to simultaneously ensure that the image doesn't get distorted, and that's where a metric would be really helpful is in designing co-designing those two things. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but like uh, you're right, like you know the, the 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 kind of lenses that we have these days, they don't really have a big problem with uh, designing very cheap, inexpensive uh, distortion correction functions. Mm -hmm. But maybe you know uh, a metric can also help you figure out like automatically like you know what decision you need or how good how good the distortion correction can be. Yeah. No, I was also thinking whether the fact that we can do experiments will help define a metric uh, the other way around. Yes, but we yes, can do that's, that offline. Yeah, that's exactly. I, I, yeah, I have a, I have a slide just on like uh, how how uh, Elixir helps. Uh, design good useful metrics for AR and VR, and that's exactly the reason, right? Like um, you have. In, you have insight into the system for the first time, and that tells you both the kind of problems that you will experience and can fix with good metrics, and also like you know data that will help you do that. Um, and then third thing is like because it's end to end, uh, that's the first time you can actually look at end to end uh, uh, image quality and what fact how factors influence it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, running ahead. Uh, let me just quick quick check on time. Yeah. We have thirty minutes. Okay. Good. Um, you can so, always come back another time, by the way. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll try to like, uh, yeah, uh, all, all of the, all of what I'm talking about is in the paper. So like, you know, uh, it, the discussion is sort of the more important part here. Uh, so I'm happy to like, you know, uh, not finish or uh, run to the discussion part of this presentation and then stay there for more longer. Um, so then we perform a temporal and spatial decomposition of these frames that we received. So once remember that these are in like physical units now. So they're physical units of intensity as well as angular density. And so now we have to per perform like a decomposition to identify what is the individual energy at each frequency, spatially and temporally in this image. We take some shortcuts here 
uh, we take, you know, based on sort of previous uh, psychophysical results, we only take two temporal frequencies, zero hertz and five hertz, and we try to uh, decompose the image into these two. There is some evidence in literature that that's most of what's going on, even though there, there's definitely, you could get benefit if you did a lot of work. If you're also aiming for the metric to be really efficient. So we try to minimize um, uh, the components we consider. Similarly for spatial frequencies, instead of just taking a frequency transform, uh, we can decompose it into a Laplacian pyramid that gives us sort of frequencies at powers of two. And so um, uh, helps us identify like what are the spatial content in each of the images and then isolates them. So then we can treat them separately based on human perceptual sensitivity to each of those frequencies. That's my dog, by the way. Uh, so that's the next step, right? Once you have those free spatial and temporal frequencies, we want to kind of take the difference between the reference and test uh, spatial and temporal frequencies and then figure out which one of those are visible. And specifically, we're going to use the contrast sensitivity function as the basis for computing the, sense, the magnitude of these differences. Uh, it is well known in perception literature that uh, if you modulate the contrast and frequency of a si visible signal, um, there is a kind of a nonlinear effect on uh, how well it's perceivable. So in this example image, uh, you're increasing contrast as you go down and you're increasing frequency as you go right. And you can see that as uh, as contrast increases, the point at which this gray, uniform gray image turns into like a real signal that you can see is not like a straight line or a, unif or a monotonic line. It's actually kind of like this curve roughly. And it depends on, it also depends on like where you're looking it from. So if I like step five feet back, I will have a different curve here. It depends on the viewer condition. But effectively what it tells you is that, um, that anything, any difference in two images that is in the zone above this uh, line, which is uh, you know lower, either lower contrast or higher frequency, or for a, for a given frequency, the lowest contrast that you can perceive. If it's below that contrast, then uh, you're not going to be able to see the differences between those images. And clearly, based on the data we have, like this has to be done in the physical domain, right? You, you have to calculate a physical frequency. You have to know a physical contrast. Uh, like I said. I can step farther away or view it at, from a different condition and we'll get a different output. So characterizing this, this line carefully would help identify which image differences are not visible versus which are potentially or likely visible. So, so if we have spatial temporal bands of different frequencies for, uh, for the reference and the test image, the moment we take a difference between those two, uh, those two bands, we will... Uh, there will be some frequencies and some contrast elements that lie in this area and the some that lie in this area. We are interested in the ones that lie in this area because anything that lies here, even if it's a visible difference, we don't care about because the user is not going to notice a difference. And that's where kind of like, you know, you making judicious use of your pixels comes around is because if you're sending, spending any energy in producing pixels that lie here or uh, that, that, um, that will have this difference, then, uh, then, you know, it's, it, it's likely an inefficient use of the resources that we have. Uh, and we use several contrast sensitivity functions to devise like something such like something called mixed CSF for us. That's because we don't just need it for spatial images. We need it for time. We need for like, you know, how, how contrast or uh, how the contrast sensitivity function varies with the sustained and temporal to frequent temporal channels that we have but also uh, how it varies across the field of view. So this, this function, this line is going to be different uh, whether I'm looking at it like head on versus whether I'm looking from the corner of my eye. And uh, there's, there have been measurements that, that account for that. There's been measurements that account for how it, it is for different temporal channels. And there is, uh, uh, there are kind of like a couple of different uh, uh, pieces of literature that have different structures for these metrics. We kind of pull, mix them together and build like a, Archit build like a function that accounts for all of those things somewhat. And then we have some free parameters that we fit using user data. A second factor that we also account for is visual masking. This is, the, this is, this is different from the contrast sensitivity that I was talking about above uh, previously, because previously uh, any difference is sort of only matters in the absolute, right? Like it does only, uh, if you have a certain contrast and a frequency, you can get look up. You can look up the contrast sensitivity function and figure out whether or not that change is going to be visible. But it really depends on like what's in the what's in the image already. Like what's what what are you taking a difference from? Really, is really also important. 
because it really matters uh, if, you, if you overlay a visual signal on top of another visual signal, it can often get masked in the sense that like if you, if you look at the label NVIDIA here and then you look at it overlaid over this like, you know, rather busy image, uh, it's much harder to read in the second case than in the first case. And that, which means masking is really important to consider as well. And uh, someone asked me the last time I presented this, whether how it would work in motion, but you can see that even if you animate the image in the background, uh, you, you still, it, it's maybe a little bit better, but still kind of hard to, hard to view this. So we have a masking model that is also measured by some psychophysics in previous literature that we also utilize to um, effectively uh, further uh, reduce the contribution of differences to the final metric. So, uh, so basically uh, at this point, we have the spatial temporal uh, frequency bands, difference between those bands, and then those differences have been scaled by uh, the contrast sensitivity as well as uh, masking functions. So now we have, um, if we did everything correctly, now we have a map of, for every spatial te temporal frequency band, which pixels are in the area where they differ between test and reference and they are, uh, the differences are strong enough that a user will likely be able to see those differences. That gives you the final difference map. It basically gives you, uh, uh, these are the pixels that a user will see uh, when they look at the test and the reference image alongside. Now we have to pull it together to give one quality metric. Um, you can imagine that's a complicated task because um, if I'm, it, it, it has a lot of kind of complications, right? Like if a video where the error appears at the end of the video versus the beginning of the video versus, or whether it appears throughout the video, it's gonna have different perception. If you have, if, if you have an artifact that appears like you know, in one corner of your image versus like the entire image, it's gonna have a different perception. So we have to kind of figure out how to pull those values together into a single number that can be uh, predictive of what the average user or what proportion of users will conclude when they look at those images. So we perform pooling across all of those dimensions. Uh, we effectively take a P norm uh, across uh, each frame of the video, uh, each temporal channel in, the, in each frame of the video, uh, each Laplacian band in each temporal channel in each frame of the video, and then finally each pixel in each of those things, right? And uh, the reason we take P norm is that sometimes, you know, for it, it's quite likely that for some uh, differences, just taking a mean across the uh, domain that it's in is sufficient. For some of them, it's like maybe max is sufficient and want to be able to span the, uh, the entire uh, mathematical domain between them. And we, we start with like, you know, free parameters that help us uh, perform this pooling. And then we use user data to fit those parameters. And then uh, the final output is also uh, fit to like GOD or just objectionable difference units. Uh, if you've heard of JND in perception, just noticeable difference, it's very analogous to it. Effectively, uh, we, what you want is you want to scale our outputs in a form that uh, a, a given amount of difference has a, has a probabilistic meaning of whether uh, or how many users will be able to tell that particular difference. So if you, so if you anchor our reference to a score of 10, um, if, we, if, we, if our test image scores a nine, uh, then we, we conclude that 75% of the people will be able to tell the difference between those two and find the test more objectionable than the reference. Uh, when it's eight, it's much significantly worse. We can provide the probability for that of how many people we receive, like it'll be close to like 90, and then it'll go further and further as you go to like eight, seven, six, and five. It can also be used as a comparison between like two test images. If you have a reference image and a test image A and test image B, and then um, the difference between the scores of A and B is one, one, one JOD. That means that 75% people will prefer uh, the one with the higher score. Um, if the difference is less than that, then the preference likelihood is gonna be lower. And if the difference is higher than that, then the preference likelihood could be higher. You can imagine that, you know, if you have uh, uh, an image that scores nine, which is perceptually like, you know, we try to give some perceptual meanings to them. Uh, which is a slightly worse quality than reference, but noticeably so, versus an image that scores a six, where there are parts of the image that are totally destroyed and like, you know, distorted beyond recognition. 
you can expect like you know nearly 100% of the people are going to pick the one with slight distortion so this so it, um with the we, by using a god output we try to uh, uh try to try to provide a more meaningful uh result to the from the metric okay uh now moving on to fitting the metric we use uh, four data sets to fit the metric uh the first one uh, is part of this paper which we collected while working on this paper, which is this foveated dots data set. Effectively, it's like animated uh, dots of like, you know, various gray level values and that are blurred and downsampled with different filters in a foveated manner. And we try to, and we ask people which one looks better. And what we're trying to see is like, you know, what's the level of visibility of these of each of these artifacts and level of preference based on uh, whether you have aliasing versus blur and those kind of things. The top right is an image data set with have image distortions and lots of measurements of what user thought were the degree of distortions in them. And the bottom two, we have two uh, sort of foveated data sets. One of them is foveated using um, uh, video compression. One of them is foveated uh, using a sort of novel algorithm out of UT Austin. And um, the, uh, this, that was kind of using uh, different compression for different parts of the video. Um, and then we have like, you know, user scores for all of those pairs of uh, images in all of these data sets. They are kind of described in different units, like the top two are in geo, already in GOD units, so we can directly use those data sets. The bottom two are sort of mean opinion scores, which is like, you know, um, uh, which is calculated a little bit differently. Um, a user is providing a rating rather than selecting between two alternatives. And then what that does is basically makes the numbers not transferable between JOD and DMOS. So what we did was uh, we performed a very small like user study just between the authors of the paper and a couple other people where, um, where, we, where we calibrated the scores of the bottom two data sets to the same JOD scale that I had in the previous slide where like, you know, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, they all have a meaning. And so we tried to like adhere to that meaning and perform a quick user study to uh, to match those, effectively converting the bottom two to also the same scale, and then we can kind of use them all together to optimize the metric. And we perform the optimization, and then we measure and compare the metric uh, with sort of alternatives in this area. There are some foveated metrics here, some regular image metrics here, and we uh, test them over all of the data sets that we just talked about. Note that uh, we only use 20% of the data sets to train and the rest was used for validation. And so uh, despite that, uh, FOV video VDP performs a significantly improved, uh, a better score, a lower RMSE on GOD than all of the metrics that we tested, which is very encouraging. Uh, the most, probably the most uh, competing metric is HDR VDP3, which is also designed by, this, uh, by overlapping co-authors, but also really accurate. However, it doesn't consider any foveation, hence it really, go, really fails for like foveated data sets. Uh, now let's move on to some example results. So uh, here's uh, four videos of the same kind of background with like some distortion applied to them. Uh, the top left, the, the left side, the left column contains like static distortions and the right column contains like uh, dynamic versions of those distortions. The top row contains lower frequency distortion, the bottom row contains a higher frequency distortion. And once we look at the, uh, and here's the distortion. Once we look at kind of the uh, scores that the various metrics generate from these values, we notice that there's virtually no difference between the outputs of SSIM and FLIP in between those these images because the aggregate value or change that you, if you just look at the difference is really uh, about the same over, over the course of the video. Also, both of those metrics have no uh, temporal support. So for them, the left and the right columns are identical uh, as far as the metrics are concerned. You can see the significant difference in FOV, VDP, FOV video VDP score. Uh, the most prominent um, output, uh, the most prominent kind of artifact is at the top right here, as far as I can tell, and this, uh, the metric predicts, some, uh, the metric prediction aligns with that, where the, it gives a score of 8.3 roughly. Uh, as opposed to the other where they're all in their nines, where it's like, you know, it's it's possible that some people might miss that artifact while looking at those images against the reference. But uh, with an 8.38, you can expect like, you know, most people to easily see that artifact. Um, here's another example. This is uh, looking at downsampling with, of a video with different filters. So the, on the left, we have a bicubic filter. On the right, we have a, uh, we have a, a nearest filter. And as you can see that the right, 
um, has a, you know, it's significantly more aliased, even though it's like a higher contrast and maybe even preserves more detail. It's like temporally not, um, uh, not very appealing. And that is reflected in the output of FOV video BDP, where there's a, there's a, there's a difference of one, one unit between left and right. However, uh, if again, if you look at more conventional metric like SSIM, uh, it's, it's a nearly identical score. In fact, it's slightly better for the, uh, uh, slightly better for the right than for the left, but it, it's about the same, so it doesn't really matter. So, the, so SSIM is not able to capture the difference between them, but, uh, but a metric that does take time into account will capture that difference. Now let me talk about a few applications. Obviously you can use it to build foveated renderers. So if you're writing a foveated renderer, if you want to evaluate or measure the quality of the perceived uh, image, you can use FOV with VDP with the right kind of um, uh, uh, parameter setup to tell you whether uh, users or how how prob how likely is this for users to find the difference. And uh, here I would note that in most foveated renderers, you're not looking for the absolute score. You're looking for like difference of two between two algorithms if you're improving because um, uh, it is between a reference and test image in a four-weighted video, it's almost, even if the foveation algorithm is working correctly, there's always, um, uh, there's always difference that you can tell if you were to, if you were asked, and uh, that's just not the goal of the algorithm. It's more about acceptability rather than uh, being able to see absolute differences. So this, you probably have a lower, like higher tolerance of uh, distortions here. Uh, we can also, because we uh, have a retargetable metric with physical units, we can actually uh, use it to, uh, you can compute it in different viewing conditions. So here we are looking at a uh, compressed video with different compression ratios. And then we're also looking at it when, when the video is viewed from like um, uh, different distances of the display. So in the middle row, you have something where, you, where, you, where you're viewing the video close up versus on the right, we're using the, where we're viewing the video from far away. And you can see that the metric rightly kind of identifies more errors when you're nearby versus when you're far away. So if you're three display heights, like the, the videos look a lot more similar than if you're like, you know, viewing it then from close up. Um, here's an, um, here's a, um, here's an artifact. So here's, here's a slide showing the impact of frame rate and judder in the video. You can see that we're comparing uh, two videos uh, where the top video is 60 Hertz, the bottom video is 30 Hertz. And uh, the bottom video naturally has some judder artifacts, especially with like radial translations, um, which are worst for uh, frame rate kind of artifacts. And then you can see that the metric kind of rightly finds out most of these artifacts, specifically to notice is that the artifacts are most noticeable in the high frequency areas. So the, the background uh, push here, um, that's where you'll see most of the artifacts or the edges of the surfaces, you'll see most of the artifacts simply because those are where, uh, it's easy to perceive the differences. In the smooth areas, you will not see much artifacts because um, uh, the judder is not just perceivable in those areas and as is rightly pointed by the metric. Uh, the results of for judder actually match um, previous papers that have specifically only considered judder. So that's super encouraging as well. Uh, we can also use it for some more kind of, uh, you know, niche applications. This one is uh, called subtle gaze direction. It is kind of a concept in computer graphics where you can use like, um, stimuli in the peripheral vision to kind of redirect someone's vision. So if you want to try to tell a story or redirect someone's attention to a particular important part of a scene, then you can, um, you can use subtle guest direction. Um, the, the key component of subtle guest direction is that it has to be subtle. It has to be, uh, it has to be the difference has to be not too much, so strong that it kind of overwhelms or uh, reduces the experience. So FOV video BDP can help predict like, you know, what is the minimum amount of dis distortion that you can pre pre present to get like a just, just meaningful difference in visual quality that the, some, someone will notice. Moreover, um, these effects are temporal and they're mostly presented in the peripheral vision. And so no other metric will be able to account for those things because this just doesn't, the one doesn't exist. So if you had to kind of tune this metric without a user study, then you would need to use something like FOV video BDP. Uh, so to conclude the uh, discussion on, on FOV video VDP, it's a metric that is, helps identify some perceptual artifacts that are relevant to AR VR displays. Uh, it consid considers both temporal artifacts as well as peripheral vision. Um, it is retargetable to near eye displays and it's like open box and kind of provides perceptually meaningful results. 
it is efficient as far as metrics go, but maybe not as efficient as we maybe something we want uh, eventually. Uh, there are certain factors missing. It requires a fully aligned reference, so you need to have that ideal image with you. Uh, it does not model eye mo motion, like I said earlier. It doesn't model color. It doesn't model non-local masking. So if you have like a busy scene versus an empty scene, you're likely to see differences a little bit differently. And then it also has limited support for some higher level ARV artifacts, like the conflict between vision and vestibular system, or like transparent AR displays and the artifacts that alignment errors there can introduce. Um, but like those are, those are problems that are like really interesting for future work and future metrics that are like this. And so um, I spent some time thinking about like how metrics interact with the Elixir project and the goals of the Elixir project. Specifically, um, uh, uh, the, the, the point that I realized that because of the practical limitations on, uh, you know, that we have on measuring how humans perceive images, these are both like, uh, you know, how fast you can model and run those things versus also like what we really know about the human visual system. Because there are some high level artifacts that are even today, uh, very poorly understood. And so because of those limitations, like metrics just by definition almost have to be like tightly coupled to the target task that they're working on. And so they're kind of narrowly focused on uh, the, the, the goal that, you're, that you have with the metric. Uh, and hence, there, hence, you know, all these examples of the things that came up during this talk and in previous discussions that the things that the metric doesn't, this metric and even other metrics don't really target is because like, you know, uh, we're either not aware of that um, that problem or the right data or the right perceptual models are just not understood enough by the system. Uh, it is the problem is worse because of the uh, the the way the AR VR ecosystem is designed right now, with everything being closed box and not well understood, and half the factors are reverse engineered in the wild, and um, those things are not really help don't don't really help like you know uh, build up the uh, uh, the community on building good metrics. And that's where I think Elixir can, can, can be a really good game-changing um, uh, platform because of its open design space. Uh, it will expose the opportunities that, you know, uh, that um, it, because of the open design space, it can basically identify things that we never know are taking place in like in the, in the factories or in the design environments of, uh, of like uh, commercial headsets. So just like, like, you know, how, how accurate is your post tracking? How, how well is your lens distortion working? How expensive it is? How, what, what, what is your lens constructed out of? What material it is? Those kind of things are like, uh, you know, completely open to like, uh, on, only open by reverse engineering and not by something that is easily found out by looking at a manual or looking at a metric. Um, there's also very, almost no opportunities to perform end-to-end -end optimizations because again, the system lacks transparency so you cannot, uh, it's very hard to like, you know, uh, go from like some hardware change all the way to the final image. There's so many factors that may be missing in the middle and, and, and having an end-to-end -end system certainly exposes the opportunity to do those uh, big changes that will, you know, maybe the optimizations are like, instead of 2X, 3X, they become more like 10X because of uh, how, far, uh, how far you can look. Uh, and so uh, that's, Certainly, Elixir certainly helps prepare um, the environment to develop those metrics. But on the on the flip side, any metrics that, that that do get prepared with Elixir as a platform are clearly going to be useful across the industry, simply because um, they would have identified the problems that are relevant to this area, and they would have identified because of the way they are built opportunities for improvement. So, for example, I think sir, uh, Professor Adve, you were absolutely right when you said, "What is the impact of this lens?" distortion correction, right? Um, it's very hard for me to answer right now because I don't know what kind of crazy lenses are gonna come around. But if, if we found out that like, you know, because of, um, um, you know, Elixir, because of Elixir, we had this particular lens design that uh, really lends well to inexpensive lens correction, even though like, you know, it's, it's hard to understand that, um, even though it's hard to, uh, understand how that lens would ever produce a good image. But with the specific display optimization um, and our metric, we concluded that works well. That could be something that's useful across the industry, like you know, someone else that's building a headset or you know, someone who's doing it in their, in their garage. Uh, and here's another example that we've also discussed in the past where if you wanted to measure the, the perceptual impact of pose error, which is like a real problem that you guys had, 
um, our metric can't model it, but there are there are existing models in the literature that will help build it. Like there's redirected walking, that does talk about what is the difference in the vestibular and visual system that you can tolerate. And I, because I didn't have good insight into like how these headsets are built, wasn't just wasn't aware of this problem. And so um, it's sort of also effectively bringing like you know bringing insights into into alternate communities which don't have access to this information to help uh, to help them identify problems that need to be solved. Even though like you know it may not it may not be a complicated solution, but if the problem is not available, you just won't be ever solving it. Like in this case, so that's kind of uh, that's kind of where I wanted to end. Um, I, I think I have. A, we have a couple of minutes, but I think I can stay for five more minutes and um, okay. uh, have the rest of the discussion. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Anjul. Um, uh, so I'll open it up to questions, but before that, I do want to announce that next time we have um, uh, 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 Brian Chris Brown from uh, from the North Star Project. I think many of you know about uh, Project North Star. If you've seen the Elixir videos, that's the headset we use. It's an open source, do it yourself. It's a, it's a pretty incredible effort. So Brian will be talking about that effort and what you can do with Nordstar. So that should be an exciting talk. But, but back to Anjul and questions for, for Anjul. Yeah, um, looks like there was, um, there was a hand raised. I... Oh, that was just applause. Oh, OK, <laughs> OK. Yeah. Okay. Um, are, are there any questions? Yeah, I, uh, yeah. Oh, okay, Malash, you can go yeah, ahead. Go ahead, Malash. Yeah. yeah, so um, so I have a couple of questions. So one is, so some of these um, metrics, right? Some of, not metrics, some of the features like, you know, these eye movements or some of this color co contrast sensitivity that we didn't consider. Is there a specific reason, reason why you did not consider? Oh, uh, yeah. So a couple of reasons. I think we with metrics, we're trying to uh, really like, just like with all systems, metrics, all systems, we're trying to walk a fine line between like overcomplicating the system versus uh, like trying to only look at factors that are really important to the output, to producing a meaningful output, but at the same time, also those that are uh, more easily available. And yes. color color happens to be one that is uh, specifically harder to find good models for. Just be, like if you look at like psychophysical literature, it's just full of grayscale experiments. Uh, and like, you know, there's very little studies except some really recent ones that consider color in any detail whatsoever hmm. um and so uh but on the other hand uh if you look at image quality if you look at image compression algorithms and uh, sort of how uh you know a lot of people design images it's well known that like errors in color are a lot more tolerable than NLN luminance so hmm. like you know if you look at video compression for example they use give you they give the color components half the bits that they give the uh, luminance luma components and so given those two facts, like we chose to omit color out of this metric because we thought we could get a reasonable result without using it. And if we did have to use it, it's gonna be really complicated and we may have to do like another user study just to measure those parameters from users. And it just like, these things tend to blow up really like, you know, uh, you wanna measure one small number and it takes like six months because uh, you have to do a user study and you still don't know if you get a good conclusive output. I see. But like in the paper, I see it's mentioned because of the computational problems. I mean, here also. Oh, that's the third problem where we have to be efficient too. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was kind of curious, like why we have to be computationally efficient? Like we can compute the quality metrics like offline, right? I mean, if it's for real time computing, um, this is not a, a no reference metric, right? Like. Uh, that's a very good question. And I'm a big supporter of metrics being really efficient, but you're right that like traditionally metrics have not been looked at something that should be efficient because it's done offline and it's done like somewhere else. Uh, but there's two main reasons why I think metrics really need to be as efficient as possible. They need to be speed of light. Uh, the first reason is uh, that, you know, with the way optimization is shaping up to be in this century, it's like, you're, you're using optimizers as loss functions and metrics as loss functions. And that means you may have to run them through like millions of steps before you get something meaningful out of them. Hence, those things need to be run fast. Like if, if a metric becomes a loss function, it has to run really fast. The second one um, is that um, the moment you add time to the image, now you're looking at videos and a single second of video has 60 frames. And like I, like I said, this metric runs really fast on GPUs but it still takes 15 seconds for a single second of a 4K video. 
And so, um, uh, yeah, on a, on, a, on a top end GPU. And so if I have to like, you know, let's say do a comparison between 30 seconds of two videos, um, that's like already like, you know, minutes and, you know, may potentially go into hours if depending right. on the kind of content, if you have 8K, if you have stereo, if you have like multi-layer, suddenly you're in the domain where like, you know, just the amount of data that you're pushing through the metric is so much that mm -hmm. you're gonna, like, you're gonna have to uh, take, yeah. you're, gonna, you, you're gonna want to take those shortcuts. Like for uh, FOV VD VDP is a hundred times faster than HDR VDP three, which is a metric. And, and um, just just from users of the metrics, we found out that they, they, that's almost off, that's for many users, that's the main reason why they're using FOV VD VDP is that because it's so, so much faster. Yeah. Yeah, um, I really like the last answer, last metric answer, especially okay. with the deep learning, everything is, you know, trained on some of these last metrics. So it's really useful. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, great. I think uh, Anthony had to leave, but Anthony, he has instructions for you, uh, for Tao. Tao, Anthony yeah, has instructions for you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the nice talk, first of all. Uh, and I kind of want to ask because I think uh, uh, instead of uh, exploring a 2D video comparison metrics for VR AR applications, there has been some people exploring a uh, scene capture for uh, especially 3D volumetric video. For example, the representation could be voxel blocks, it could be point clouds, could be uh, mesh geometries. Uh, kind of wondering, have you ever uh, thought about what will be uh, good metrics for uh, comparing uh, 3D volumetric videos? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, um, I guess the, uh, the sort of uh, the backup answer would be that you have a system that produces an image at the end of the day and uh, or a sequence of images at the end of the day if you're rendering it for a display. Um, and especially when you look at like, you know, at the point at which the user consumes it, it's an image, it's pixels, uh, or it's like you know rays of light that they consume. So um, mm -hmm. if you have a good image metric, you can always fall back to it to uh, to get some sense of quality here. And it is also sense, seems to be kind of the strategy that a lot of uh, deep learning optimizations methods use. They instead of like you know trying to put an error on like an intermediate representation, they try to put an error on the final image and use that as a loss function to kind of Get a sort of like you know like a bigger advantage in the uh, in in how they render the images and fox that watch that not important. That said, um, if you were like solely working on the representation and the quality of the representation was most important to you, um, I think you would need to have some polymetric met some metric that is kind of in the in the expresses things in that third dimension um, and measures you know accuracy or um, uh, you know the quality in, in that axis. The tricky part would be that you have to bring perception into that dimension. Uh, at the moment, the perceptual models that do exist and are measured are in, in the domain of uh, you know, people looking at images. So you have to convert it in some form to, or, or take hints from that into the, uh, into the domain of uh, uh, your volumetric representation. So um, an example that I might have I might ask, um, I might kind of uh, imagine is that um, you might perceptually measure for a user, what is the distortion in a particular edge that they will tolerate. And then you can uh, convert that distortion into a 3D, uh, uh, into a 3D distance that you can tolerate in a, in, a, in a volumetric surface representation that you might have. So a surface is only allowed to go by, you know, uh, by like a certain, a few millimeters or whatever. Um, because given our viewing conditions, anything more than that will be will, a user will not tolerate. So it's tricky to do it in 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 the space of the representation that you have. Um, people just tend to fall back to like you know have a system and these days have a differentiable system that renders an image from that representation and then uh, optimize for that image because there's a lot more metrics, a lot more quality uh, tools that are available at that level. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I agree that uh, the accuracy of the geometric model and the perception uh, quality of the user are different, but might be interconnected. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. so Tao, you should um, get Anthony and I and you know you guys, the, the subsets of our groups that are working on 
on scene uh, reconstruction, uh, uh, volumetric streaming, etc. We should just get together and uh, we have we have a lot going on here. I know you guys have a lot going on there. We should just get together and figure this out together. Yeah, we, we uh, should actually uh, discuss offline about this. Yeah, because I think uh, there are a lot of things that may uh, that might be like very uh, common, and we can collaborate yep. together. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, cool. So thank you. Um, are there, I don't know if Anju can stay, but... Uh, Unfortunately, I do have to run. I have just a meeting running over, uh, yeah, but yeah. I can take, I will send slides and I can take questions offline and over the uh, next meeting as well. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Anjo. That was, that was really very, very good. So, thank you so much. So. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.